Hey y'all, Rayshawn here. Thanks for watching In The Wild. Today we have a special treat for you because we're gonna talk a little bit about things personal fitness and how the university actually prepares students to go off into those careers. So first up, we have Dr. Hannah Bennett, who is the program director for our kinesiology program. And we have Dr. Stephen Page, who is the department chair for teaching and learning over at the College of Education and Human Development. And he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the sports management program, which is new to the university. And of course, is involved in that, but he's gonna show us a little bit more about what you could do with a career in sports management and in that industry with that degree. And later we have a little local celeb coming on to the podcast. Dr. Jed Ballard is a ER physician, but he's also a professor in helping train some of the future ER uh, physicians. And he's done a lot of things in the personal fitness space. So we're gonna talk to him a little bit as well because you know, this year we've all been talking about how we want to improve ourselves. So these guys are going to talk a little bit about how we can do that from, I guess, the personal wellness side of things. So here we go. Well, welcome you guys to the podcast. Excited to have you. I think you're only a part of a few folks that we've had from the College of Ed and Human Development. So excited to have some of y'all uh, come talk to us on In the Wild. But to get started, can you talk a little bit about how does kinesiology and sports management kind of contribute to promoting just overall health, fitness, and just like a healthy lifestyle, I guess? Yeah, do you want to take that? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's difficult sometimes to talk about kines because um, even my family, when I say I teach kinesiology, they're like, I don't know what that means. How do I announce that to people or describe that to people? And so what I like to think about is the umbrella of the study of movement uh, with the body. So we com we're comprised of things like exercise science, um, sport and exercise psychology, exercise physiology, fitness assessment. Um, so all of those components link together and are interrelated. Um, and our program really highlights the need for both uh, physical wellness, mental wellness, emotional wellness, and really all the dimensions of wellness that we talk about, especially the ones that like the Jags Live Well really highlight. So. That's kind of how I would describe kinesiology and how we relate to, I would say, the greater overall health and well-being of individuals. And for sports management, it's sports. I mean, <laughs> it's um, but it's not only a lot of people look at it as the team sports, the national, uh, the college, or either professional, but it also deals with the sport industry, and you've got all the all better or worse term, uh, alternative sports. The ones about like fitness, if it's mountain biking, if it's triathlons, those have a large presence of people behind the scenes that are working to put those events on and to promote those events. And so anytime you're involved in any sport, hopefully you're being somewhat physical and you're staying active. So that's how it ties right in. Um, and kind of going off of that for students who are looking to become part of these programs, like what opportunities or experiences could they expect to have with y'all? A lot of different ones. Um, I think the great part about our program is that we do kind of run the gambit on all dimensions of health and wellness. Um, so they could do in their exercise physiology class or fitness assessment class, uh, they could learn how to do take blood pressure. Um, they could do a VO2 max test or a Wingate test. Um, they could look at um, different elements um, in biomechanics. So they might look at um, different angles at which you know your foot hits the ground when you run. Um, but yeah. then we also have um, classes that relate to working with those uh, with diverse populations. So we've got. Um, we have speakers that come in to talk about what is it like working as a pelvic floor physical therapist? What's it like working with those with intellectual disabilities? Um, and so there's a ton that they could be exposed to. Um, and I think that we really do hit so many different facets of wellness that they wouldn't, they would leave our program very much prepared for whatever it is that they want to go into afterward. So what are some of the, I guess, career opportunities off the top of your head that a kinesiology major could get after graduating? Uh, so we have had individuals go into things like um, uh, coaching. Um, we've had them go into things as like um, leading 
like group fitness classes as their own personal trainers, um, wellness and life coaches. Um, some of them have been like coordinators at, for instance, like the YMCA has like a wellness coordinator. Um, some of them have gone into youth sport where they work for uh, potentially, like Columbia County has their own you know, recreational center, uh, so they could work within that facet. Um, we do have a lot of students that go on to grad school, uh, so we've got a lot of students that are very interested in things like OT and PT, the CNL program, um, and they're, I mean, they're, it's really about finding the niche that you want to be involved in, and then our job as their professors and advisors is to kind of guide them through so that they can find a place to go afterwards. Cause I think it is a little bit, a bit of an uneasy concept to think about where am I going next? And especially now that advising is kind of in full swing. Um, I've got a lot of students who are like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Uh, and so we kind of talk about, well, what are their interests? And then how can we use their kinesiology degree to guide them to that direction? And for sports management, when we designed the program, uh, we worked with um, Dr. Simon Metcalf from the whole College of Business and our program is different than any other in the state that it's a Bachelor of Arts. We did that so it would have a liberal arts background so we could work with Pamplin and also with Hull College of Business in the classes that we offered and like we have marketing classes that are required as part of our major. We also have it where they can get um, a minor in any area of sports management they're interested in, for instance, communication. There are several um, that of our students that how we're getting communication minors and a sports management major because they're more interested in the media production or the writing portion of it, whereas others may be interested in the business aspect of it. Um, and again, when they grow to graduate, anything from working facilities management to working um, intercollegiate um, athletics to um, working for a professional team, um, any of those. Also, the national. There are several of the executives out there that have sports management backgrounds. Um, and so, any it's a very fast growing field, a very changing field, um, with technology becoming huge, <laughs> a major part of it. Um, but so, our classes cover, we try to give them a very broad range with a liberal arts background so they can take the classes and some of the advanced classes that they have from Pamplin and it can work with our degree. So speaking of technology, how are y'all able to incorporate modern and I guess emerging technologies inside the classroom or working with students because they'll be using that outside of the classroom? How does that come into play? Well, I mean, especially with fitness, there's so many different apps that you can use and also so many different devices. So. Um, Right now, um, for instance, we work with a lot of students on research in our under, like in undergrad classes, um, and some we've got some students right now that are working with us on a study utilizing um, Fitbits um, to enhance exercise adherence for those that might be classified as um, overweight or obese. Um, so we, what we what we could do is look at that and help them understand the data that can be captured from that and how that might influence someone's exercise adherence as time goes on. Um, I know that we have a lot of different um, uh, different software, or there, we have a lot of different software that we can utilize for things like um, stress tests or VO2 max tests or wing gates. Um, we've got heart rate monitors and blood pressure cuffs and um, we've got, I mean, just so many different kind of fun things um, that students don't necessarily know about until they take those classes and do those labs. Um, but we inter integrate technology pretty pretty heavily in a lot of the different classes that we offer. And for, if I could add to the kinesiology, we also have two professors that are conducting research with students using uh, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Uh, using Oculus. Um, and, because it's an emerging area. Yeah. And um, one, both of them have completed their initial research studies, and um, that's Dr. Andrew Moore and Dr. Um, Daniel Green. And Dr. Moore is now conducting another one using, basically looking at those exercise programs. What exactly, how effective are they? Are they effective? Mm -hmm. Just because they say it is, is yeah. it? Um, and as she was saying about the VO2 max, I mean, we have technology that can, um, we use it to test any athletes and to see exactly how fit they are at what point 
to have they reached a threshold to show that they're giving their maximum effort. For sports management, esports is huge. Oh, yeah. uh, it is huge. Of course, with AU now having an esports team, um, I know Dr. Philip King, um, sports management professor, he's already met with the esports team here and he's very interested in learning more about that um, as far as what the efforts are here. But I mean, that is a huge arena. Um, and we hope to have, to work toward possibly having a, um, in conjunction with them, you know, possible a class on it. Are there any other, oh, go ahead. No, I thought that was cool. I didn't know that we were going to do that. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other like emerging trends that y'all see on the horizon for, I guess, just your areas overall that you would love to incorporate into your programs? So I know for, for me, so my background is in exercise and sports psychology. Um, and so um, with the, uh, thankfully, with the emergence of more um, athletes and celebrities being much more open about their mental health struggles, I think we are pushing against the stigma of uh, seeking out mental health assistance. And so I'm, I'm very much concerned with student athlete mental wellness, but also our student population mental wellness also. Um, we know that it's super necessary. And if we are going to address all the dimensions of wellness, mental well-being, emotional well-being is a huge component that tends to be overlooked. And um, we don't really serve that dimension as well as we could. So some of the classes that we offer, the sport and exercise psychology addresses that, but we also have a class called stress and emotional wellness. Um, where students are very much exposed to what stress does and how your body reacts to it and how we um, can hopefully mitigate some of those stressors that we have in undergrad um, and as professionals. Um, but I feel like our, our degree really does offer a lot of opportunities for students to feel as though their mental wellness is being taken care of and addressed in a very appropriate manner. Um, so that's, that's what I'm very, I, I feel very, um, passionate about related to, to our degree? Um, with sports management, there are two areas that um, I'd like to see us um, delve more into. One would be the um, idea where arenas, they no longer are just, used to be when you went to a game, you just went to the game. Now you go for an experience. Mm. Um, you can see it with um, Truist Park. You know, they've got the shops outside of the park. You walk through an area before you even get to the game. Um, Mercedes-Benz is another example. It's more than just the game. And so um, having something with facility management where we go more into that in our class. And also um, with my personal favorite sport, college football, you know, <laughs> with right now with the NCAA, what's going to happen to the NCAA and Division One football. Um, right now, it's, a, it's, it's moving. Who knows where it's moving to, especially with uh, two major conferences meeting together versus the other conferences. Staying on top of that and understanding what is the role of the NCAA in college sports and in this time because it's going to be changing. And so staying on top of that and how it's going to be changing is going to be very interesting. When like also how like NIL deals will impact that too. Or what you can do with the NIL deal versus what you, yeah. right now Tennessee's under investigation. Mm -hmm. So it's, who knows? <laughs> uh, but switching gears a little bit uh, to just talk more broadly, how do you think the perception of personal fitness and wellness it overall has kind of evolved in recent years? Because I feel like, especially on the digital side of things, like things have changed quite a bit. I think that there are, there's some positives and some, some negative trends that we've seen, um, especially related to social media and things like body image um, and the statistics coming out about specifically female body image at such a young age being not great, we'll say, um, and the impact that social media has over that. Um, we know that we're not going to be able to stop technology. We're not going to be able to stop uh, the advances that are happening. Um, but I think we have to find ways to, to address how it negatively impacts the emotional wellness and 
um, the psyche of our of our younger generations. Um, I think that's one of the, <laughs> the negatives that we see. But also, in on the flip coin, on the other side of the coin on that, we've got influencers that are trying to do the, a body positive movement um, and really trying to highlight how you know social media can be a positive space where you can find people that encourage you to feel comfortable with who you are, um, encourage you know healthy um, healthy choices, uh, finding things that you enjoy doing when it comes to fitness, not just falling in line with the latest trends. Um, and I think that that's a really great thing to have. I unfortunately think it is still being a bit overshadowed by you know the social comparison that we see at such a young age. Um, but I would say like that's the probably for me that's the biggest one that the trends that I've that I've seen. For me, I'd go to youth sports, and I mean, the research shows time and time again, youth that are involved in some kind of sport have a more likely uh, tendency to be more physically active the rest of their life. And with youth sports now not so focused on the score, you know, at the recreation level, it's not so focused on winners or losers. Now, there are some who do still, yes, but also, um, so that's one trend that where everybody participates, you know, at the rec league, especially if if you pay and you're on the rec league, everybody's going to get in the game. That's huge for those that may not be the most athletic, but at least they had an enjoyable time while there. And of course, what we see with tackle football, tackle football is still decreasing across um, the United States for youth. Flag football is now picking up. Um, for the past two years, flag football has stayed um, at the same lower level. Soccer, of course, is big, especially they even saw an upsurge last year when Lionel Messi signed with Inter Miami. They saw a huge impact that that made for United States soccer, for youth, more people signed up. So the trend is to get more students or youth active when they're small. They will be active when they're older, more likely to. Yeah. And I would also say in that trend, I think a positive trend that we've seen has been the um, the increase of exposure of women's sports. Mm. Um, we've seen such an uptick in that. And I mean, you look at the NCAA women's basketball, you've got Caitlin Clark at Iowa and Paige Beckers at UConn and the um, South Carolina is phenomenal, the whole team. Like it's just, and like the, the exposure of female coaches, I think that representation has been so valuable that females can see themselves in those positions and see that um, it's, we, are, we are trending toward people being very interested in women's sports. Um, and I find that to be just very um, heartwarming, <laughs> you know, as, as a female. Um, and also they, I mean, this one's just brand new in terms of women's sports, but they just have, they just created the, um, inaugural, um, women's national hockey league. Oh, so, wow. I yeah, didn't know that. So now you can see, so my niece is eight years old and she plays hockey, um, ice hockey and she loves it. And now she could potentially do that as a profession, which we have not seen. So I think it's very valuable to see things like that, um, just the exposure of women's sports just being so much greater than it has been in the past. And I, I love it. Another aspect yeah. is like the fastest growing sport in America is pickleball. Oh my gosh, that, yes. <laughs> that I did actually know. Like yeah. pickleball is going crazy right now. They're actually, you know, having these little wars going on with tennis about taking over the courts. Mm. So that's, the, I mean, but pickleball is huge. Mm -hmm. Competitive leagues, um, national tournaments, you can see it on ESPN, of course. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. So, I mean, there is interest in more people getting active. One trend that I enjoy seeing on TikTok are registered dietitians, like being able to give their input. Because for me growing up, dietitians is not something that I was familiar with. Yeah. So being able to, not necessarily directly, because it's not personalized for me, but to hear people actually speak their expertise on foods that we love or foods that we don't know about and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, Having that perspective that I didn't have before has been, I found it to be really interesting. Yeah, and I think that's also one of those like um, positives and negatives because you've got people that are super credible giving you that advice. And I think it's important for us to be educated consumers of that yeah. sort of stuff because you also have those influencers that are like, this is what I do and this, mm -hmm. these are the calories that I eat. And it's like, well, it's okay, that's great. <laughs> it's great for you, but is that, you know scientifically based, evidence-based advice that you're providing to people or just 
feedback that you're providing. So I love that there are registered dietitians on there that are coming up and like talking about foods that we don't know about mm -hmm. and teaching people how to read a food label. And exactly. Like, it's, it's those shorter videos that hold our attention because we know that it's not great most times. Uh, and I think that those are, those are fantastic. Before I let y'all go, I have a little fun game that I wanted to play with you called Fact or Fiction. So I'm going to read some statements and I just want you to give your thoughts on them or whether or not it's fact or fiction. Oh gosh, I'm like really nervous about this. <laughs> Probably just nothing crazy. Um, so first up, I want to say it's a real softball of a question. You uh, say that now. It's... <laughs> I think so because technically you already answered it, but let's see if you get too nervous and psych yourself out. So the term kinesiology comes from the Greek words kines and logica, meaning movement and study of. That is true. <laughs> That's a fact. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> See? <Yes. laughs> um, next up, fact or fiction. The field of sports management does include business and administrative aspects of sports organizations. Fact. Fact. Um, next up, kinesiologists primarily focus on biomedic biomechanical and psychological aspects of movement. I with the main like the mainly focus on like mm -hmm. I I don't I don't know I feel like that's a great that's a great area type of question I'm it's okay to add some context to as to why well because I feel like we we encompass so much more than that um but I guess if we're thinking about mechanics we can also like that's anatomical stuff that's structural that's exercise and with psychological stuff i would say facts question mark <laughs> i'll go with that okay. <laughs> uh next up high intensity interval training is indeed considered one of the most effective and time efficient fitness trends true fact fact uh fitness trackers may not be entirely accurate in measuring the number of calories burned during exercise fact, fact. <laughs> Uh, spot reduction is not a scientifically proven concept and you cannot lose, f lose fat from a specific body part by exercising in that particular area. Fact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stretching before exercise does not always prevent injuries. Dynamic warm-ups are often more effective. Fact. And ancient Greeks did emphasize physical education as an essential for the development of a balanced individual. Fact. Thank you for that history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fact. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. You scared me because you were still <laughs> staring. I was like. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to let you have that one because it was a historical question. So you got them all right. They, they you know was, your stuff. Yeah. I felt, felt good about that as you kept on going. <laughs> I promise you, no trick questions here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, any final thoughts about your programs or the student experience that students could look forward to if they become students in your departments? I think they would have a great time. <laughs> We're a really fun department. We we work really well together. Um, our we have great relationships with our students. Um, there's only like three or four classrooms that we utilize, so they're on the same building. You don't have to worry about parking at the Christenberry. Oh, yeah, true. I feel like that's a huge pull. Um, but also, I think our students also mesh really well together, um, and I, I've very much love watching their relationships grow and kind of having those with the students as they kind of matriculate through their freshman year when they're really nervous to their senior year when like I'm sad to see them go most of the time and <laughs> uh you know it's uh our department's fun um and uh, I think we're pretty innovative when it comes to like the research that we do and the ways that we you know teach so I have to say my faculty are present they are there there it's, it's huge when Students come to see, and they're used to seeing us in the building. Um, I have very caring faculty, all of them. They're very caring. Um, I'm lucky to be the chair of them because they do care. They make they make my job easy. Um, and you know, it's we're over there. You know, a lot of people forget we're over there, but we're over there. Um, and you know, it's nice when all of your classes are there. Their um, labs are there, and you know, of course, parking. We have no problem. <laughs> we have no issues. Cool. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks.
Hello, my name is Susan Davies and I'm your Vice President for Enrollment and Student Affairs. I'm so delighted that I get to talk with you today about Four to Finish. These are four aspects that we want you to incorporate into your life here at Augusta University in order to be successful. We feel like if you incorporate Four to Finish that you will be happier with your Augusta University experience and that you'll graduate on time. So what is Four to Finish? Number one, engage. We want you to engage both inside and outside of the classroom. Join a club or organization. Speak with your faculty member after class. Engage in undergraduate research. Number two, we want you to make purposeful choices. Make purposeful choices about how you spend your time, about your major, um, and even about who you study with. Make purposeful choices. Three is to develop your academic mindset. We want you to come into college and to be a student here at Augusta University with a growth mindset, with a mindset that allows for you to learn from others and to bounce back easily from mistakes. And number four is to follow your program pathway. This means following your curriculum in order to graduate on time, but it also means thinking about what you want to incorporate into your academic program to make it even more holistic for you. That might include an internship or student leadership. When you graduate from Augusta University, we want you to graduate with your degree in one hand and a career plan in the other. And four to finish will get you there. Well, thanks for being here, Dr. Ballard. Uh, excited to have you. Uh, and getting started, can you share a little bit about your journey with emergency medicine and kind of how you found your passion with ER? Yeah, no problem, Sean. Thanks for having me. Um, so ER for me is just kind of what wound up working out, essentially. Um, I think I'm a strong believer everything kind of works out like it should, and I did not have a you know, super clear shot directed path, um, but it's what... I landed in it's where I fit. Um, I guess going into that a little more like, um, I grew up small town Montana, born in a house, not a hospital, didn't get shots till I got them when I was 20 on my own. Oh wow. You know, we didn't go to doctors. I think the first time I remember going to doctor was in college for a sports physical for soccer before we got chiropractors to fill out the forms for high school stuff. And um, anyway, along the way though, I was always passionate about the human body. Um, I had a natural aptitude for school and I liked school. And if you want to do anything that's going to require 12 years of education post high school, you need to like it, yeah. uh, regardless of your aptitude. You know, it'd be much more important to be an average aptitude student that really enjoys school than to be a genius that doesn't like school if you're going to go on for a 12 year course. I mean, that's just how it is. Um, but yeah, as I was kind of coming along that route, um, a couple different things happened, whatnot, and I started to have some professors notice that. You know, I was good at things like that, and they kind of suggested it. And um, honestly, it never really crossed my mind as a career. Um, but enough people tell you you can do something. I started to believe it. Um, so I wound up taking the MCAT, you know, did well enough, applied to one school, got in, and, uh, you know, kind of here we are. So, um, yeah, it worked out really well. It worked out really <laughs> well. Um, and so as a ER physician and you're also a professor, mm -hmm. like how do you balance that of – teaching and training, but also still saving lives. Yeah, and that's actually one thing that kind of keeps me in Augusta, is we have a really good mix here to where that combination is great. You know, you need to put in a number of shifts to kind of get your feet underground and be good at emergency medicine. So, you know, you got residency, those are your 80 hour weeks, you're really learning stuff. And then right after um, residency and stuff, I was working more shifts in the hospital. But essentially here, what you can do is split your time a little bit. So currently I'm 50% med school, 50% hospital. So I work less shifts than someone that would just be doing ER. Okay. And that's how I make time for the teaching. Um, so it's really not too bad of a, too bad of a gig. Um, it's a good mix for me. So how did you f realize that ER was the specialty you wanted to go into? Yeah, and that one was, you know, I came into medicine pretty naive, like I told you, um, having not really had any personal experience, me or family, but... As you're in med school, you go through rotations. And I honestly thought I wanted to be a small town primary care doc, family doc, but um, as I was rotating through the hospitals, I just realized ER was absolutely where I fit. Um, I do like that instant gratification. I like that on my good days, people are literally coming into me 
within 15 to 30 minutes of dying and when I'm doing stuff right. Sometimes they'll literally walk out, other times they're doing fine and we bring them to the hospital. Um, you know, my bad days are also bad. People legit die in front of me, but um, I like that. And I also like a skill set that's kind of useful no matter where I'm at. Um, literally two of my last four flights, I've taken care of someone that passed out on the plane. Oh, wow. And most docs just really are uncomfortable in that situation, you know, when they're like, I need a doctor. Uh, they really said I need an ER doctor. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally yeah. serious because, you know, you're just not going to be comfortable. Otherwise, um, if the zombies attack, I'm going to be let in and fed <laughs> because I have useful skills, right? <laughs> if I'm a retinal surgeon, like, I don't have my equipment, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, yeah, that's kind of what brought me there. And it's just where I fit. It's opened a lot of doors. It's kind of my people, um, you know, a little outdoorsy, a little fun, but can get it done when you need to. How do you kind of decompress and unwind after you have those bad days in the hospital? Yeah, different ways. Um, kind of all the normal stuff, you know, hanging with your friends, all things like that. Uh, when it's been a particular bad string, sometimes I'll go off in nature by myself. Uh, like working as an ER doc through COVID wasn't the best of times. Yeah. Um, I did half of it community medicine, just working where I single coverage, meaning by myself, and half of it here where it's a big academic center, so it's a whole ER team. But um, what I would do after a string of nasty shifts, sometimes I'd just pop out to Colorado and go climb 14,000 foot mountains by myself. Oh, and wow. Yeah, basically, once the physical hurts bad enough, you forget about the metal. <laughs> That's just how it is. Um, um, do you have any, like, interesting or really memorable stories or cases from the ER? Yeah, an ER, I mean, that can go the entire gamut of range. You know, it's are you looking for funny? Or are you looking for sad? Or are you looking for, you know, because you kind of mm. see it all. Um, there was one, uh, I actually wrote an article about for Men's Health that wound up on the front page of Yahoo News, which I thought was kind of cool. But, that is cool. Um, but yeah, the case was kind of not as great. It was just this super cool kid I'd taken care of a couple different times. And he was really good kid, but had a tendency, you know, he just grew up a little bit hood, honestly. And, you know, so first time I saw him, he was breaking up a knife fight at his high school between two girls. Oh, wow. And I spent a lot of time with him because I had to put in about 30 stitches. Um, and then saw him another time, and then ultimately he wound up uh, getting shot in the face at a party and uh, didn't make it. And that's, you know, kind of where the article came about and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was pretty memorable. And some of those set in, but um, it's an understood part of the job, I guess. So, you know, like you don't sign up for the Army if you don't think you're going to deploy. Yeah. Things like that, you know, it's just kind of, it's part of the job. And I think it's an absolute blessing I have the job. And I understand there's going to be highs and lows with it. For future doctors that are considering going into ER, what would you, what would be your best advice to them getting started? Yep. So, um, you know, there's kind of the, the big hurdle of getting into med school, which is, it's really hard to get in. And once you're in, it is difficult because undergrad classically is about 15, you know, hours, credits a semester. Uh, med school averages 20 to 30. So you just got to be kind of ready for that. But you're getting through all that and you're deciding what specialty. There's a couple different factors you want to go in. Uh, number one and most important by far is where do you feel like you fit? Uh, you're going to be rotating through the hospital and every specialty kind of has its own personality, its own whatnot. Um, so you really need to kind of find a spot where you feel like you fit. Um, two, is it something you like to study? To be good at being a doctor, I still study. I have weekly study schedules and stuff. You know, um that are self-imposed. And to be good at being a doctor, you need to study throughout your whole life. So if you're in a field that you don't enjoy studying, you're probably not gonna excel, to be honest, because things change in medicine, there's a bunch of info, you just have to kind of stay on top of that to be yeah. great at it. Um, and then three would be do factor in the lifestyle implications. You know, make sure you're going into a career that fits your other life goals, because end of the day, it's still a job, you know? Like, I'm Jed, I work as a doctor type thing. Um, you know, I'm never going to be the dude with a license plate that says surgeon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because like I identify with so much more outside of my job, though it is very important for me to study hard and be great at my job. So you need to kind of factor in those lifestyles and make sure, you know, if you want to have kids, if you want to do some other stuff, does the career you're choosing align with your other lifestyle goals? And if not, what's more important to you? Yeah, I was just going to ask, like, how do you, manage that schedule of like you're in the hospital sometimes you're with students sometimes mm -hmm. but then you're also you know hiking doing stuff in Colorado like how do you, like what does that schedule look like it seems pretty crazy it can be um and it's all about you know there's times in your life when you have some control over your schedule and times not so residency for example 
I understood going into that, there's three years where I don't really own my time. You know, that's, you're gonna work 80-ish hours a week a lot of time and you're, that's just how it is. Um, but once you're on the outside, you know, it's always this kind of balance between time and money. You know, and it's always this negotiation. You just have to decide kind of what matters more to you and learn how to say no. That is such an important life skill that's really difficult. Um, and what's even more difficult is saying no to good things. But if you don't say no to some good things, you won't leave a door open for great. So mm. you got to kind of spend that you time, figure out what's important to you, and then adjust your schedule accordingly and adjust the yes, no's to opportunities accordingly as well. But, you know, into the wild obviously made the cut. So, yeah. uh, you know, I know it's important. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just about to say, I, I appreciate you making the time because I know your schedule is, is crazy. Um, switching gears a little bit, though, you're a big supporter of personal fitness. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, your personal philosophy with physical well-being, but also like professional success and being able to connect the two? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that is kind of my passion, either functional fit or fun fit, kind of however you want to put that. But that's something I do, you know, exceptionally well. I'm never going to be the bodybuilder on stage type thing. Um, I was too small for the NFL. You know, there's just like <laughs> some stuff I realized at this point that aren't going to happen. Um, but being able to maintain, you know, full-time work, a life I enjoy, and keep very healthy um, is something I'm really good at and something I'm really passionate about. Uh, kind of coming through that, I was lucky to be, you know, I like kind of touched on before, but we grew up real rural poor, uh, but with that, exceptionally active, because we didn't have a TV or anything like that, so, you know, very active, chasing wolves around the woods of Montana and stuff, um, and just my family was always health conscious. Mm. So even though I hear often the excuse of, oh, health food costs more and things like that, but I mean, like I said, I literally lived in a barn in first grade and we were still eating pretty healthy. So I know it, <laughs> I know it's possible. Um, you just got to put a little bit of thought in there. You know, like rice and beans are cheap. They're actually incredibly good for you. Um, but uh, when you're kind of coming along, there's the kind of tiers of fitness. Uh, number one is, you know, what you're generally eating. And it's what you do most of the time that counts. You know, you absolutely shouldn't be the dude going home on Thanksgiving or Christmas counting calories and stuff. You know, don't be weird about it. Just generally eat good food. And it's really not that complicated once you kind of get into it. Um, we can, you know, I could divert forever on like <laughs> how to eat well and things like that. But I mean, essentially, it's just eat quality food sources, a lot of fruits and veggies, good protein, and limit stuff that you know is crap food. And everybody knows what crap food is. You know, if you're opening a box to get to a package, <laughs> you know, it's over half sugar. I mean, it's not, it's not that hard. And then what people tend to do also, big mistake, is they kind of get lost in the trees and lose sight of the forest. And that's kind of a fault in the marketing industry. Uh, fitness nutrition is a very heavily marketed type thing, and it's much easier to sell a new superfood than just a common sense, regular, like, hey, eat health, like, good food, a lot of fiber, things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's the nutrition side of it, um, and it's just, again, eating generally good most of the time. Um, not getting weird with it or anything like that. Um, and if you want to gain weight or lose weight, you're still going to do the same thing. You're just going to adjust your portion sizes. You want to gain weight, you eat more. You want to lose weight, you eat less. Like I said, it's really not that hard. <laughs> People make it way too complicated. Um, and yeah, we can divert. I don't know how long you want me to ramble on one question, but <laughs> we can go into fitness strategy too or what you want. Um, so just kind of following that, what does your like wellness routine look like for the week? Yeah. Um, so activity is exceptionally, exceptionally important. Like if you could take the benefits that regular exercise has and sell that in a pill, I mean, the market for that you know, we're talking longevity, weight loss, butt looks better in jeans. You know what I mean? I mean, like literally all these things, people will go to surgeons and pay tens of thousands of dollars at a shot. Regular exercise does for you. Um, but it does take that consistent work. Consistency is probably the most important thing. Uh, so for me, what I like to do is, you know, I like balance. I like being athletic. If a buddy wants to go for a five mile run, I want to be able to jump in and beat him. Uh -huh. um, if another buddy wants to lift, I want to jump in and hang. <laughs> you know, so I just like that kind of well-rounded approach that lets me do anything I want. Um, also, if I have kids, grandkids one day, I want to be able to take them up mountains when I'm 70. So, you know, I'm not trying to do powerlifter style squats all the time because my joints matter to me, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's just kind of adapting and being smart with it and really listening to my body. But ultimately, principle-wise, it's just being active every day 
And then I like a huge variety of that. Because what happens is people find what they like and they wind up getting overtraining injuries. Uh, very common with runners to get things like shin splints because they love to run. They do that all the time. But if you run one day a week instead of six days a week, your odds of shin splints go down to almost zero. You know, but you can still keep your heart and your lungs up by swimming, biking, lifting, you know, all these other activities to just keep that balanced fitness profile. That makes sense. Um, and the fitness wellness industry is always evolving. Mm -hmm. Are there any current trends or newer things that you kind of find particularly interesting right now? Yeah, and as a sweeping, sweeping hole, and that's kind of a, the problem with what works and what marketing is, what works are these super boring, long-standing, effective principles that have been working for people for a lot, a lot of years. None of that's flashy and easy to sell. So there's always trends popping up, and a lot of the trends do have valid aspects to them, um, but as an overall whole, it's what you're doing most of the time that counts. It's like, it's how you're living, not what you added, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, so there's not really one particularly flashy thing that I like, though I could touch on a bunch of things that kind of come in, like, you know, hit cardio, for example, is something that smart athletes have been doing for a lot of years, but somebody named it and kind of branded it and did a little more research. So it, it kind of could fall into trend, but it, it is really effective. That makes sense. Um, but switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. have a fun little game for you before uh -oh. I let you go. <laughs> I'm scared. Of, What's Sean going to do to me? <laughs> <laughs> of what I'm calling wild takes, where I'm going to read off some more trends, and I just want to give your your take on them. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so first up is home workouts. Home workouts, I absolutely love them. Um, because the number one by far most effective principle for fitness is consistency. So anything that you do to decrease the activation energy of a habit i.e. how hard it is to make it happen, that's going to be an absolute win. So simplicity is a win to form habits and decreasing activation energy. And home workouts do not have to be super complex. It just has to be something you get done on a very regular basis. Huge win. Uh, next up, wearable technology. Wearable tech, I am not against, though I'm not a personal user. Okay. Um, coming from super small town Montana, I just don't like robots. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> But this is something I have friends and whatnot that have used them and had very good results with them. I'm a little bit slower to speak on something that I don't personally use because I don't feel like I have that firsthand experience. But I'm not against them. I'm just not an expert by them by any means. That's fair. Uh, extreme dieting. Um, it depends on your goals, honestly. Um, as a So say there's a wedding you have in two weeks and you want to look better in those pictures. Absolutely effective. Uh, so if you go on something like a strict keto diet or something like that, you will, you know, absolutely drop weight fast for that. My problem with dieting, and they've actually done really big multi-center studies on this, is dieting is an independent risk factor for weight gain on a two to five year scale. Um, what happens is any sort of extreme dieting, you're going to decrease your basal metabolic rate. And the reason we kind of put on weight is because we're in a plentiful society and eating is fun. You know, it's meant to be fun. Um, so anytime that you're burning less calories as you rest, you're setting yourself up for failure. Mm. Um, so extreme dieting will absolutely work in the short term, and you can absolutely expect to look worse in a year than you did when you did your two weeks. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, next up, fitness influencers. Uh, so also broad, broad range. Um, you need to vet your influencers a little bit um, and kind of you know, make sure that your influencer don't look as much at their followers, but look at is what they're doing consistent with what your goals are. Mm. You know, for example, say you're a 55 year old professor, you know, and you want to look a little healthier. Um, the 20 year old that's crushing bang energy drinks, you know, and throwing up three plates may not be your best choice. They might be really popular, but you know, you need to kind of find someone that's a little more consistent with your goals if you want to look at their training. The other thing that would be, you know, a really intelligent thing would be kind of look at their credentials. Yeah. So from a fitness influencer standpoint, if someone has something like a CSCS, um, that is a pretty difficult fitness degree, training degree to get. And you can automatically kind of trust some of their gym experience that it's going to be not off the wall, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that, that's a good point because sometimes, like when I'm doom scrolling on TikTok, mm -hmm. you'll come across, you know, a fitness influencer that'll say, oh, this is how you can lose weight or this is how you can do blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, you achieving that goal is a lot easier than some of the other people you're trying to, you know, 
market to, like you mentioned before. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that, you know, that just matters. There's, and the good thing with social media is it's broad enough that you should be able to find someone that's pretty similar to your situation. You know, if you need to lose a hundred pounds or something, you know, find someone that didn't used to be fit at all and made it happen. Yeah. Um, you find someone, honestly, like me, I mean, with med school and whatnot, I have studied it a lot, but you know, realistically, I grew up healthy and active. I've always been healthy and active. Um, so I just have a different experience than someone that's going to the gym for the first time, a hundred pounds overweight. You know, again, I've like read on it and stuff, but it, but it's different than that first hand yeah. experience actually going through it. Um, speaking of weight loss, weight loss drugs. Yeah. Um, and are we talking prescription over the counter? Where do you want to go with that? Mm, let's say prescription. Okay, um, there are some, you know, Ozempic and its family is exceptionally popular right now. Um, they are honestly really effective. The kind of the downside to it, like if I was going to compare Ozempic to actually sticking to a consistent exercise program, I would take this night and day just every single time because it's so much better for you, so much healthier, so much safer. But Ozempic is actually exceptionally effective. If you're going to do it, here would be my advice for it. So the problem with it is people tend to lose weight while they're on it, and it's an expensive drug. As soon as you stop it, people gain the weight back. Mm. But if you take Ozempic and you use that weight loss, you know, so say you're down 30 pounds, exercise is just a lot easier to do when you weigh 30 pounds less. Um, so if you use the time while you're on it to develop some very healthy exercise habits, as you're developing those exercise habits, you're improving your eating, you know, use it kind of as a kickstart you might be able to get off it and just keep your healthy habits. Um, if you're just using it and trying not to change other stuff, what it literally basically does is just make you not hungry. It just makes your stomach kind of full and you're not hungry. Um, and it, again, it's super effective, but um, as soon as you stop it, the weight's gonna come right back. If you don't change those other habits, why use that weight loss to help kickstart you? Next up, uh, influencers filming in gyms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long as it's not excessive, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm sometimes impressed by um, people's courage with that, I guess, <laughs> you know? Um, I still have a little bit of social awkwardness with it, though I will, you know, do some gym workouts and whatnot. But, but yeah, as long as it's not using up a piece of equipment forever, whatever, like I understand that people are kind of trying to do the hustle. It's how society's going right now. And like, whatever, <laughs> own you. <laughs> um, and then last up, dietary supplements. Mm -hmm. So dietary supplements, a um, couple that I use and believe in that are very research backed. Um, whey protein, I'm slow to call it a supplement because it's actually a food. It comes in a jar so everyone thinks of it as a supplement like, oh, is it safe for kids and blah, blah, blah. Like, bro, you just gave your kid a bag of hot Cheetos. I can promise <laughs> you the bag of whey protein is way better for the kid than hot Cheetos. Um, it really is just basically milk protein separated out. There's whey protein and casein protein. Um, and that just comes from milk. So it's, it's a very clean, very good source. Um, why it's important is just because it can be hard to get enough protein to meet fitness goals in everyday life. It can be, you can do it, it just takes a lot of effort and some cost. Whereas whey protein's about 50 to 70 cents a serving. Mix it up and you're done with it in three minutes. So big fan there. Um, creatine, exceptionally well studied, exceptionally safe. That's gonna help you put on a little bit of muscle mass, which even if you're trying to lose weight, when you put on muscle mass, it increases your basal metabolic rate, so it makes your whole life easier with that. So big fan of creatine as well. Those would be the two kind of most studied, most supported, the two I use regularly. Any final thoughts for wild takes I didn't ask you on? <laughs> no, this is great, Rashawn. Uh, like I said, I think AU is just a great little spot. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, it's what kind of taught me to be a doctor once you combine it with the medical college, Georgia and everything, and uh, made a lot of good friends here, a lot of good people down here. So appreciate you having me. and. Uh, Get out there, get that fitness journey going. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks for talking to us. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Take care, y'all. All right, y'all. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you really loved it, do us a favor. Like, subscribe, do all those things to engage with us on Spotify and on YouTube because we're on all the platforms. And we want to talk to you and we want y'all talking back to us. So do that. And I hope wherever you are in whatever relationship you have with wellness, physical wellness, personal fitness, all the things. 
uh, just take insight from these guys. And if you are a student here looking to switch into one of those majors, or if you are a prospective student thinking that you want to get into those majors, reach out to those guys because they're going to be here to help you. So I'll talk to y'all soon. See y'all in the next one.